Ah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. Can somebody say, yes, Jesus? Yes. Amen. Would you stand to your feet if you so are able to, not obligated to, but what a privilege it is to be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. And the reason I know that is, is after speaking with my father this morning, Pastor Dad, his fourth week that he's unable to attend church, and that's not good when you're the preacher, because his leg is just not working. And he is reminded, as I am reminded, that sometimes we take for granted of what we have that we can stand on. I know we have one in the house as well is having difficulty standing. But how many of you can just say, thank you, Lord, I can stand this morning? Amen. Can you say, thank you, Lord, I can walk? Amen. Come on, wiggle some fingers, raise some Amen. I'm alive today. And it's because Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're a guest here today, we welcome you to Hope. When you walk in, you're a friend, but when you leave out, we want you to know that you're a part of this family. But what's most important is that before you leave this building, if you're not a part of the family of God, we want to give you the opportunity. to. And in a day that you think not, that trumpet shall blast. Y'all forget those scriptures? Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was listening to an old song this morning. It says, I got leaving on my mind. Anybody ever heard that song? I pray that that is what is in your thoughts today. I've got leaving on my mind. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the privilege we have to stand in your presence and to give you glory. To give you glory, give you honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Who brings the power This is unfailing love that you 
You may have a seat for a moment as Pastor Belinda comes, gives you a little ad, if you will, of what's coming here at Hope. Hey, Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that's all right. That's okay. I think we can do better than that. There's a lot of people in here. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that's better. That's better. All right, so we do have a few announcements to cover today. So today, by the way, like pretty sure exactly today. I could be wrong. But it is the midway mark for those of you who committed to read through the Bible yeah. in 183 days, which is basically six months. So yeah. we're three months in and yeah. three months to go. How many of you are still, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm I shouldn't. I'm up to date. Put that, are you up to, who, I had okay. to work on it, but who, I'm up to date. Yeah, who, who is working on it? Who is working on all right praise god God. that's all right that's good that's good keep it up and if you do like pastor said you got to get caught up sometimes that's okay don't like put condemnation on yourself for that spend the time in the word of god and it isn't something magical mystical to do it in six months we're just trying remember what we say it's not about getting through the word of god it's about getting the word of god through you and so we want to take these these big chunks we want to take these copious amounts of of time to be with Jesus and when we do that when we're spending time in the Word of God he speaks to us we're able to understand more about his character his nature his purposes his plans in general as well as how that applies to our lives personally so that's why we encourage you to do it you can still get on board you can go hey I'll go for the next six months and let's just read the Word of God let's get it through us I encourage you if you need any help like how can we how can we kind of do this, uh, you know, we're, we're here for you. We want to encourage you. So stay on it. We're doing it too. And we're, you know, keeping track or staying on top of it um, as well and looking forward to whatever, well, day 183. I, I don't know. I kind of go backwards. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. All right. So also this coming Saturday is our church work day. And I have a little bit of a, an adjustment. Oh, thank you. Okay. So I've been saying ages 12 and up to help uh, across the way. My apologies. I, I had that twisted. I had that wrong. Um, so it's ages 12 and under that are going to be a part of our, our children's Christmas program. So we definitely want them to be here and be a part of the practice and then the fun day that they're going to have following. So the 13-year-olds and over, they are able to join us um, adults to be over at the, at the work day. So if you're planning on being there for the work day, not necessarily the the children's part I know that you're in connection with Pastor Stephanie on that but if you're planning on being at the work day would you let us know and sign up at the or on the the clipboard in the lobby so just let us know that you'll be a part of that and like I said that's uh, or not I didn't say but it is at 8 a.m. and we'll have breakfast tacos and then we'll also have lunch at the end of the day so two meals two for one hamburger steak on bread (laughs) and speaking of food we're gonna fast (laughs) <laughs> nice transition there. Uh, but we are going to do a fast, a church-wide fast, November 1st through 21st, so a 21-day fast. And we're going to approach this one in a uh, intermittent manner. So we're going to be spending that time uh, in prayer. And you determine what that kind of three- to five-hour window is going to be for you that you will – I'm standing somewhere funky, I guess, huh? Um, so that three- to five hours that you will fast with us and pray. Um, so – Keep a lookout for that. That's coming in the next couple of weeks, really. And then finally, also November 20th, so at the tail end of that fast, that Sunday, right before Thanksgiving, is our community-wide, our area-wide Thanksgiving service with the Lavernia uh, Ministerial Fellowship of Churches. And so each year we rotate where we have it. And so this year it's going to be at First Baptist Church. Um, I don't have the address up there, but we'll get that added on there. But First Baptist Church, 630 on November 20th. So those are all the announcements. Let's get back to worshiping the Lord. If you will stand back up, please. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
and worship and offering. My bad. I totally forgot that. So, <laughs> so return back to the Lord. <laughs> and today for the seed faith, so we always go with the same day of the week. So today would be $23 back to capital area or area improvements and expansion if you want to give back to that. Amen. You know, we finished a series here recently on worship. And I hope that it expanded your, your thinking of how we worship the Lord. Encouraging us, each of us, to come back to our senses in worship. Using all five senses God gave us to worship Him. Yes. We come to this part of the service and I don't want it just to be a part of the service. I wanted to give you an opportunity today. We transitioned out of the last song with the word worthy. Does anyone in the house truly know that he is worthy? He is worthy regardless of what he does in our lives. Because as one song put it back in my day, I'm dating myself a little bit. It was all done and taken care of on the cross. Everything since then has just been icing on the cake. Come on. He took care of it at the cross. Recently I was given a prayer and it was in regards to the property next door, and which is that's where our work day is focusing this coming week. God's amazing miracle of allowing us to be a part of this purchase and the expansion of what He's doing in the kingdom work here at Hope. But the prayer was fully funded, fully functional. God, you are the supply. It's a prayer I've been praying. A declaration of prayer. But then the Lord really began to nudge me and through the help of the Holy Spirit began to really stir me that that prayer applies to everything. Fully funded, fully functional. God, you are the supply. And, and in one of the areas this morning I exercise as, as I pray the prayer over Cindy, who's unable to be with us today because she's at home sick. God, fully funded, you paid the price on Calvary with the cross. Fully functional, Lord, is by your blood we now have healing that we can now have life. God, you are the healer. Maybe this morning you need it to be in another area of your life. You know, we could just sing here. We're not here to entertain you, by the way. If you want to watch the Dove Awards, they're on TVN. They're doing the replete over and over. All we're here is to help stimulate your your righteous spirit to worship and bring worthiness to the one who is. He was, and he's the one to come, but he is today. We're going to worship him. But whatever your need is today, he's bigger than that need. He's bigger than that need. And it's in your need, your present need, that I believe God wants to work today that he might receive all the glory so that someone else can see what he did and say, you know what, I think I might want to try what you've got. The only place I can find jealousy is a good thing is when people look and they're jealous of what you've got in the Lord. So this morning I'm going to just, some of you I know don't feel like worshiping. Some of you may not even feel like standing right now. But I want you right now to begin to just pray. That's how we're opening this, this time of worship and song. I just want you to pray, and I want you to hand over to the Lord your burden. What's a burden? That's something that's heavy. That's something that you're not really pleased with carrying and having in your life right now. It could be emotional. There's some burdens here today that are heavy. John, it's good to see you. Not here to embarrass you, but I know you were close to your dad. It's good to see you today. We're praying for you. Hand that burden to him today. It's easier said than done. I know that. So it's by faith, folks, that we do that. If you're a guest here today, you say, what, what's, what's this pastor doing? He's giving you an opportunity to not have to leave this place the same as you walked in. And I don't want to just bang it out with drums and keyboard to get to. I want you to just simply know that the great I am is in the room. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need a physical touch in your body, I want you to. I want you to touch that part of your body with your hand. Say, Lord, I, de I declare your word in my body. That by your stripes, I am healed. 
I am healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You and your spouse had a little tiff this morning, maybe a big one. You have the boldness to reach over and take them by the hand and say, Lord, thank you for my spouse. Thank you, Lord, I don't have to do life alone. Not in this matter. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, Lord, I apologize to you, but I apologize to them. Oh, Lord Jesus, I want to love them like you love me. So, Lord, I want to love you first before I even love them and try to do it on my own. God, you're good. You see, I'm, I'm building up because this song here is called Worthy of It All. And you need to know that all is all. All is all. He is worthy of it all. Lord, we thank you. Marilyn, would you start it?
If you know it, for thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all the
your hands, your eyes, your feet, when you let your heart worship, he said out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth will speak. We worship you for you are worthy, worthy. Oh, we praise your glorious name, Lord Jesus. Mighty, mighty to save, mighty to heal, mighty to deliver, mighty to restore, mighty to move in this place, mighty to shake the very ground that we stand upon, mighty, mighty to awaken a generation, mighty to work through the body of, oh, hallelujah, the body of Christ. Mighty, mighty are you, mighty are you, mighty are you. Glorious, Lord. Hora makoshe, para bakiasi, glory to you, Sita. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Worthy asi, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, we worship you. Worthy are you, Lord God. Hora makoshe hatarara. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Isn't it good to be in his presence today? Isn't it good to know that he does still inhabit the praise of his people? I know this is not about feeling, but boy, it does feel good, doesn't it? Hallelujah. I'm glad my, my feeling caught up to my faith this morning. Hallelujah. I knew he'd be here. Hallelujah. But I believe that the creation cannot with, withhold when the Creator gets in the room. Oh, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill toward all men. Amen. We can say Christmas stuff when it's not Christmas yet, right? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now give Him praise with your hands together. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Before you sit today to hear the word, we're going to have a time, Lord willing, at the end for sometimes we do our altar service for our guests. If you just are curious, we do our altar service right now. But the Lord just is urging me to get into the word so that at the end of service, there's a response opportunity for you. But we want our children to have a response opportunity for them. So Pastor Stephanie and her workers, her volunteers, those who serve so faithfully, our children in children's church, as well as those in our pre-K and those in our nursery. If you're here today and you're not aware of these age groups, 
If you want to just go out the double doors in which you came in, there will be someone waiting there to help you and to direct you of how your children can be involved in one of these age brackets. They are going to hear the Word of God broke down in their level. It's not a babysitting service. It is a ministry. And we are looking forward to seeing the results as these children grow in the Lord. Can we give all of them as they leave out just a celebration of praise today? Amen, 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 amen. Would you greet one another in the name of the Lord as I grab my Bible and as you today grab your Bible? Welcome somebody into the house. Welcome somebody into the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You can pray wherever you feel comfortable. Amen. For everyone else in the room today, again, I welcome our guest today. I've asked Brother Frank, if he would, to open up our time of hearing God's Word and my time of speaking God's Word today with prayer. Could you be in agreement today? Pray, if you would, Brother Frank. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for this beautiful occasion of letting us gather in your name, Lord. We pray for our pastor and the word that you put in his heart, Lord. That it may come forth accurately. With boldness as a lion. With no fear. Not to worry about anybody that's getting offended. And speaking of feelings, I feel like the prodigal son. And I see a father welcoming the son and the daughter. Therefore, I'm going to pray like this. Father God, in Jesus' name, let your word go forth today to bring home any prodigal son that is in this house today. And the earshot of your word today. That the only shame in any of this involved is that they're not coming to you, Lord. For tomorrow isn't promised to anybody. Let it be today. In Jesus' name. And cause our hearts, Lord, to be opened unto you. For we're not blind or ignorant of the devil's devices according to your word, Lord. We see what the enemy is doing, and we need you to open our hearts, Lord, that your word, anointed, anoint our pastor, Lord, can go forth and fall on good ground. For some are going to produce a... clothing in our right minds, Lord. Let your word, Father God, through our pastors, have your way today in our lives, Lord. We need you. And we ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know why I have him praying for me throughout the week. Praise God. Praise God. I ask, first of all, for your mercy. Uh, 
Last week I forgot something extremely important as we closed out our service with John Cochelle. What an amazing presentation of God's Word. And I don't know if you've picked up any of those books and those of you that might be curious, Abide in Christ and, and Preaching, both of them he referenced. I've been reading those that just revolutionary to some thought and stirring in our heart. But I, I forgot at the end of service, I was so excited and so convicted at some aspect <laughs> to uh, receive a love offering from him. And uh, I'm going to ask today, if, even if you weren't here last week, if the Holy Spirit lays upon your heart to give in addition to what you've already done so today, just mark it, guest, and, uh, or John Cushell, if you could spell his last name, and, or JK, and uh, put it in the, in the offering, and we're going to make sure that we get that to him. This is a man who has been coming to us for, I don't know, we tried to figure this out, uh, almost, almost a decade now, I think, and, uh, but one year I told him, I said, well, we can't have you, we just... I just don't see it possible to be able to take care of you at this point. He goes, never mind, I'll just give an offering and bless you all this year. I'll just come. This man has never asked for anything and always willing to give above and beyond. So maybe that's a good reason he's not here today because he would tell me, shut up. And uh, But let's bless him if you would. Hallelujah. I am going to preach to you today. Really, it's a new vein. Uh, it's not new. Because the Bible is not new. I told my dad today, I'm preaching on an old verse. And when I told him, he goes, I think they're all the same age. I thought it was funny. And, uh, but I'll kind of set this up. And, and I'm not calling this a series. But I'm not going to get in a rush to preach. So I'm leaving the latitude that if I get to a place and I see that clock back there... I may just say put a put a marker right there. So that's a challenge to some in the room. Because if I don't finish, you're like, well, man, I gotta come back if I want to hear the rest. Yes. I do feel that pressure sometimes that I need to finish. But I'm praying that today that this anointed word coming to, as already prayed, to good soil. And it's something that I believe that we have laid aside in our conversations. It's something that we may have taken our eye off. Listen, football is in full swing. Not everybody in the room is a football fan. I get it. But you at least can understand this, this, this simple principle. If you take your eyes off the ball when it is thrown your way, you're most likely not going to catch it. And they still are less than a percentage of Hall of Fame, brother. Just going to add that in there. The chances are very, very slim. And I guess you could say, if you're very, very good, and we'll find out in eternity. What I want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you about the second coming of Christ. Okay. You say, what do you mean? Taking our eye off the ball. Take our eye off the prize. It is the ultimate prize. Eternity. Eternity. Not this temporary life in which we live. I don't know if you've forgotten or if you've just yet taken some time in 2022 to remember that this present earth, according to Scripture, will be burned up. It will be a new heaven and a new earth. We are in danger of a generation that is coming into this world that is unaware that there is, and can I say this, and maybe this is not a best time in the world to say this, being this season, but there is an afterlife. There's an afterlife. There's an after death. There's so much emphasis on that we have to live life today. We have to live it at our best. We have to live it to the fullness and to, to accept the responsibility. It is the preacher's fault.
there was an emphasis lost, we started to see it come back down and hit right where it needs to be, talking about eternal life that will be experienced after the second coming. But we had not often talked about the fullness and the, the, the abundant life living. And so all of a sudden we're, the pendulum is over here and that seems to be the great voice of the church today is, is that life is blessed on this side of heaven and enjoy it and have little expectation of what is to come because it's, listen, when we say, I am blessed, most people have not read the scripture to its fullest because the blessing is understanding I have been forgiven and I am ready to spend eternity with the Lord. We, we misuse spiritual vocabulary all the time. We do. And it is, it is the enemy, coming going back to my childhood with flannel graph on the board with Sister Dubose in Sunday school, the sly old fox, he is not rewriting the book. He just wants you to learn impartiality. He just wants you to accept in minimal. He just wants you to be happy with the, with the little bit. But be careful. It is the little things, the little foxes that spoil the vine. And so I want to stir up, re-energize, have you to consider once again that there is a gift Somewhere along the line, that pendulum changed. And our songs are no longer talking about heaven. We're, and some of them have even gone as far as to not even talk about is our goal is to live well now. Live good now. Now, do not get me wrong. I believe the Lord wants us to have a good life. But as I'm listening to that song this morning, I've got leaving on my mind. Thank you, Craig. You and I remember that song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sang by Jimmy Davis. Yeah, that was before the Gaithers. Okay, <laughs> there's one line going, he says, I think, and this is like before the Gaithers, like, have y'all seen the Gaithers? They're like older than most everybody in this room. He sings this, and one line says, I think I should probably think about getting a bigger and better house, but I just can't bring myself to do that when I've got leaving on my mind. That in itself speaks of where we are in our culture because people want the bigger and better house. I'm not against the bigger and better house. I mean, we're expanding the tent. We're moving the tent pegs even of the church. We're enlarging the, the property and the building facility.
think in everything. We don't expect fast food to be fast anymore. We don't expect fast food to taste good anymore. We don't expect people to show up early to work and call that on time. We don't expect people to do a full day's work. We don't expect even relatives to do what is right. We don't even expect kids today who are taking grandma's recipe for Thanksgiving and making those rolls, even to make those rolls. Our expectations. has dwindled. Now, I pulled a clipping. I was in my office, and there's occasional you do some spring cleaning, right? I was searching for something. Pastor Belinda didn't say this morning, but that's okay because I'm going to make an announcement. You didn't get it twice. In January, we will be celebrating our reunion slash birthday. We put both on there because it's our birthday. Every year we've been celebrating our birthday. We'll be 20 years old. Praise God. Amen. We're calling it a reunion because we're inviting everybody back. Everybody that has come through, we want them all to come. But I'm looking through pictures. I'm looking through old sermons. I, I'm, I'm, I'm digging in everything, reminiscing, checking out videos. Some of us look really young. And I looked really thin with a lot of more hair back then. I don't know if it's just aging or the church did it to me. I can't figure that one out. But I ran across this clipping, and this is a great segue. The Holy Spirit helps me with announcements as well. The only thing I could find on the date, it was during the Obama administration. Okay? So then that's a good segue to remind us elections are coming up. And as Americans, as born-again, Christ-following, Bible-thumping, I, I, I stand with the Lord. You should be first in line to vote. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Amen. And they, can't, they don't want you to talk and they don't want you to have your phones on. So some of you need to go buy some Christian paraphernalia and wear it while you're standing in line. That way people have something to read and something to talk about. And maybe when they get in there in, in, in line to vote, they have Jesus on their mind and they can't help to vote. Possibly we can find somebody on that thing that has Jesus in their values, okay? Amen. Good luck with that. That's why we pray, brother. That's right. But this here was eight compelling reasons why Christ is coming very soon. That was in the newspaper. I wonder if they put these things in the newspaper these days. I'm having a conversation with you, Dad. It's kind of the preaching style, okay? Bear with me. How to prepare for history's greatest event. I liked it. It reminded me Jesus is coming again. This morning as I'm talking to Pastor Dad, I didn't tell him anything, and he says, remember this, son, Jesus is coming again. How many of you remind your children when they run out the door in the morning, hey, don't forget, we may not be meeting back here at the house for dinner. We may all be meeting for the marriage supper of the Lamb because Jesus is coming back again. Woo, who was the last time you said that? Let me give you a phrase. You can say, when people say goodbye, you say, yes, I'll see you here, there, or in the air. <laughs> Amen. And they say, what are you talking about? Great segue to talk to them about Jesus. Mm. I'm not going to talk about, there's, this, there's a claim here of 167 converging clues, just to name a few, of says that Jesus is coming back. You're saying, where did you find those? Well, it's called the Bible. This is why we encourage you to read the Bible, and we are asking you to read it in a big chunk right now. Read it. You can do it. But he left eight here. I'm going to give them just because I have them, and there's going to be somebody that's going to catch me outside, and they're going to keep me from shaking somebody's hand because you're like, what are the eight? So if you want to write these down, you better do it fast, all right, because I'm going to say it fast. And you can study them out. All of them's got reference. Israel's rebirth. Some of these have already happened, by the way. The plummeting morality. Famines, violence, and wars, increase in earthquakes, explosions of travel and education, explosion of cults and the occult, the new world order, an increase of both apostasy and faith. Now, you say, you've got to read the book. It's all in the book. All these are there. But I like this part, the escape plan. 
the escape plan. The escape plan began with the fall of man. Jesus was a part of the plan all alone. If you didn't know this, the Trinity was present in creation. I don't know how it went down. But, I mean, God's watching going, they're about to do it. They're about to sin. They're about. Y'all think that God wasn't watching when she took of that fruit? Like it was done back in the alley behind some mulberry bush that nobody can pay attention in the dark? God's like, I can see you. I can see you. I can see you. It's like your children touching something or doing something. Like, I'm right here watching you. Are you doing it? And the father looking over at the son and the Holy Spirit going, we got a problem. I don't know if Jesus just looked over and said, Dad, I got this. You know, you told them they can have the free will choice. You knew that this was a risk factor. And they chose wrong today. Let's not blow the earth up at the moment, okay? Do you realize how long it took to implement the plan because the plan began in that? big event that happened in history, we call it and sing about it, called Calvary. In his present place, the right hand of the Father, man is a part of the escape plan. I'll give you the why all this is important in a minute. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I like it. I just don't want you to be ignorant. So if there's a reason why I'm preaching today, I just don't want you to be ignorant. Pastor called me ignorant today. No, I didn't call you ignorant. But I don't want you to be fully unlearned. You need to be fully aware. Because, let me give you this before I read my first scripture. I brought scripture today. I brought the Bible. It's what happens when you cry while you're worshiping and your nose runs. Because I have, I have been encouraging you. I think that I got a little close to compelling, but probably hasn't haven't done real well, of you, you evangelizing your world. That's a big word for telling other people about Jesus. Sharing the gospel to others. Friend, foe, neighbors, work. And I don't see a lot of movement happening. And that could be because y'all are watching and waiting for me to do something. But here in my prayer time, asking God, what's going on? What's happening? When I say it, you know, they just look at me. And some of them go, amen, and do absolutely nothing with it. You know? And then others have got so many questions. And they're trying to answer all the questions. And then everybody's trying to put it in a per personality box. Da -da. And God said, I don't know that they, this is the Lord speaking, okay? I don't know that they quite understand the consequences of those who do not accept the gift I am offering. Okay, so that's where I've titled the gift. It's Christmas, my birthday's coming, I start thinking gifts. I should probably think I also have an anniversary, I should think gift that way, but I'm still getting saved, and so I'm still a little selfish thinking about myself. So, the gift, all right? Because when we get to this time of year, there's already sales. I got my Target ad the other day in the mail with Christmas ads wanting me to go buy something for the people I love. And so, you can't, how many of you, be honest, I need somebody to help me with my illustration today. Ten, 
and tidied up and safe because you love them. And I hope you got them something that they can use. I hope you got me no sweater, okay? I got a sweater, all right? I want something I want, you know? And uh, bless you, brother. And so when, when, we, when we're in preparation of getting a gift, wouldn't there be no comparison in the gift that brings and is eternal life? So when you're thinking about Christmas, when you're thinking about your celebrations, and when you are getting into this sermon with me, I want you to think, if I'm going to such lengths to make money, earn money, stick money aside, go personally either order from Amazon, I think that what you ought to do, this is just a fun part of my life. I told my mother-in-law, she goes, because we're kind of in a, in a I want to say compound, but that may not be a good word for some of y'all. We're all living on the same acreage. And uh, they deliver the UPS packages and the Amazons. Anybody else have multiple houses on one property? They just, they don't ever hit the right house. Sometimes they don't even hit the house. They just, why is that sitting out in the pasture? You know? I told my mother-in-law, she goes, these don't belong to me. I said, cool. Take them in. Put Christmas wrapping around. Put it under the tree and put their name on it. So you don't have, they, she goes, but this is something that they wanted. Exactly. They're getting exactly what they want. It's just going to be a couple of months later. They're going to probably call. Exactly. They'll be looking for it. This will be fun. She didn't take me up on it. But there's no better gift than that of eternal life when you completely understand that people you're going to be celebrating with during the holiday season, which I encourage you to have fun and enjoy, but that you know their name is written down, and if at any point Jesus returns, they will spend eternity in heaven. But if you don't get a realization of the consequence of the alternative and the knowledge and the benefit of that which is given, I don't know that you have a lot of motivation to get it done. So it's my turn to help you get motivated. Me too. I don't know if y'all know this, but on that we call it the cry room, and it's for any ages. If you feel like crying and you don't want to do it out loud, just go in that room. There's not an age bracket on it, but there is a reflective mirror. I like it because I see me while I preach. So I'm listening to the same sermon you are. So I wanted to start with this. Matthew chapter 24. I've got a lot of little verses I want to read. We'll talk about this escape plan. And it also gives you a how to receive. It was in the newspaper. How to receive. All right? We'll get back to that. I'll use this each week. Verse 36 of chapter 24 of Matthew. Now, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. So, could it be in that conversation the Father goes, okay, Jesus, you willing? Yes. The only thing I'm going to withhold from you is I'm just not going to tell you when. That's good. You do that. All right? So Jesus doesn't even know. All right? You can pray all hard as you want to Jesus. Tell me when you're coming. He can't tell you. Because it says right here in the Word, nor the Son, but only the Father. How in the world do people get messed up and not believe there is a Father and a Son in this verse? Really? Right here. Can I read it again just for that? Nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Is Jesus coming very soon? The coming of the Son of Man. I don't know if y'all have read about Noah lately. That's why I try to encourage you to read the whole Bible, not just a little bit. But I think there's a lot of similarity between the days of Noah and today. So there's how do we preach this without going to Romans? 
going to Romans. And this is why this may take a little longer to kind of flush out and kind of walk. Y'all with me so far? All right. Is because Romans is sometimes a difficult book to digest. Anybody just read Romans and when you got through going, well, that got that one off my list. I mean, you got to pay attention. I mean, God, this has got, I mean, wow. Pastor Belinda used a $2 word this morning in her announcement. Man, those are those $10 words in Romans, like justification. Oh, my Lord, what does that mean? What does condemnation mean? Oh, we, we, I'm telling you, this book is rich. Paul is trying to convince Romans. That'll mess you up when you think this is for Jews only. I mean, read the book. I had somebody the other day trying to convince me that the latter part of the book was not applicable anymore. You're saying in our county? Absolutely. Because people begin to believe the lie rather than the truth. And it's because we don't speak of the truth as much as we even do the lie. We foster, oh, this is the Holy Spirit. This is not anywhere in my thought process coming. We foster the lie more than we foster the truth. We, we caress the lie. We, we make the lie look presentable. When the lie is presented to us, rather than getting involved, rather than putting our nose where we think it doesn't belong, rather than making ourselves possibly be at risk to look like a fool, we just stay out of it and say, I'm sorry, they just don't believe. And we back up. Man, I can't wait to get to this point in this, this, this teaching because in chapter 5 of Romans, it talks about our new identity. And the Holy Spirit says, see, I was already writing about a new identity before people were trying to identify themselves as something else. And, and what they're supposed to identify as, as a follower of Christ, as Christ in them. But then the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and says, unfortunately, people have got to the place where this is absolutely no depth in them. So they are actually identifying as a Christian, but they're not. We identify as Christ in us. And we identify with Christ in his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection. We identify in his life. We identify in the future, Jesus is coming again. I'm holding this little book in my hand. This is my Royal Ranger New Testament, and uh, this is the foundation of everything that I am. My parents made sure that I understood Royal Rangers and all the teachings and got the little Bible and got all our little code and motto in the back. I, I, I love this. It, it, ready. That's our motto, ready. I, I, I've said ready all my life. Were you ready for what? Ready for anything. Ready to work, play, serve, obey, worship, live. I, I, and we throw the word et cetera in there. It's just I'm ready for anything. Got to be ready. Are you rapture ready? Some of you in the room don't even know what the word rapture means. The word rapture is not used that much. And I'm not talking about a dinosaur. That's a raptor. Okay? But rapture, I'm ready. But it also has in here, as we said last week, the Psalm 23. Somebody's like, I'm just impressed, Pastor, you know Psalm 23. Because I learned it. It was the foundation. In the first part of this is all the highlights of stories, including the coming of Christ. But one that really sticks out to me is the page where it has the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is something that from the age of five, my dad has put in front of me verses that I memorized five years of age and quoted again and again and again all the way through 18 when he broke my dinner plate and said, now you're an adult, leave the house. And I can still quote them. And when I have opportunity or let me, I'm going to rephrase that. No longer are we just going to have our, when you Find opportunity. Go searching for it. I have verses, key verses, to help me to share with people because Jesus is coming. And the consequences of people not receiving the free gift is devastating. 
It's worse than living a life on this side of heaven with knees that don't work real well. My dad's been telling me about this. My dad, I, I was sharing that with my dad. Yeah, eyes that's not 2020. Having acid reflux all the time. And, and many of you in the room sleeping with a, with a machine. The, the consequences of not being ready for that day are far worse than anything that you can endure as a person. I told you, Pastor Dad, fourth week, not in the pulpit, his leg just not working. And when I called him and said, how are you doing? He said, what I know is that there are some people doing worse than me. There's some people out there that are not doing very well. And that's who I'm praying for this morning. We've got to realize that people are these, are, these are physical bodies. And we're dealing with other humans. And while we're doing that, we're discovering that it's hard to live this life. But this life can be solved with the life that is still to come. So I'm going to take you to Romans, all right? I want you to go to chapter 1. Let's just hit some highlights. I'm not going to get in a hurry, all right? It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. I determined that everywhere in the book of Romans that Jesus' name is mentioned, I'm going to highlight. I want you to be aware of his name. And maybe you could do such an exercise for yourself. Called to be an apostle... And set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. And who through the spirit of holiness. I just, I got to bring some of you up to speed. That word holiness was a hot topic a few weeks ago in adult Bible study. Holiness. Holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus saves us. But then, when we begin to understand He is more than Jesus our Savior, He's Jesus our Lord. That makes a huge difference in our lives that lead to holiness. I'm not going to read the whole book. I should. It says, through him and for his namesake, we receive grace and apostleship. Boy, have we just really milked the word grace. Wow, have we just taken grace to a whole nother level. And and some of us have taken it in the manner in which it has been taught and by Scripture, not by man, and understood, but because We have been casual with it. Those in the generation that have come after us has misunderstood the word grace. What I'm afraid of is that the church is going to lead more people to hell than they'll ever take with them to heaven. It's because our lives are an open and read epistle, known and read to all men according to Scripture. I believe this. People watch how we react and respond and how we live our lives. So many grace. I'm so thankful for grace. And the enemy is great with us using the word grace as long as we don't use it in the manner in which it was written and intended. I don't know if you all know this. Satan really hates you. But he hates God more. So, you are not that special. This is, the Holy Spirit just wants me to it. You're not that special that Satan has singled you out. And he's causing your life to be a living hell. One, he has not experienced hell yet. He has no idea what it is. So, he can't bring that type of experience on you. Because just as we can't imagine how wonderful heaven would be, I don't believe we can imagine how horrible hell will be. We've only got descriptions of both, and both are not very nice, least to say. 
Satan is not after just you. He is, he hates God. God kicked his butt. And I don't know about you, in my early days when I was just learning my, that salvation is a process, we'll get into that, I got in a few little toughs and fights. I mean, I had a grandpa who was a preacher. He was a godly man. He taught me. He said, yeah, man, somebody hit you, turn the other cheeks what the Bible says. And once they whack you on that side, then you hit them. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. And you make sure they don't get back up when you hit them that third time. Sorry, that's just the way it happens. And when somebody puts the hurt on you, then you go to sleep at night thinking about how you're going to get. I'm telling you, Satan is not thinking about you as much as you think he's thinking about you. He's not devising a specific plan against you. He is devising a plan and has a plan as the Prince of Powers were against God. You're his children. You want to know how you hurt? I've said this so many times. You know how you hurt me? Did you hurt my daughter? You know how you hurt me? You hurt my wife. You hurt those that are closest to me that love me the most. And shame on the church over the years for doing that to people. Satan's after to put a pain in God. He thought he put a pain in him on the cross. But he was tricked, wouldn't he? We're thankful for the gospel. I like Paul. I thank you first of all. He had a job to do, and this is the job you've been given. In verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, making sure to understand this is for everyone. I needed to say and quote this verse one because it's a very popular verse. It's a very understood verse, but you need to know you shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. You would preach. Now, here we get in verse 18. I just want you to know these words, the wrath of God. I know he's a loving God, but you need to understand, Paul did not waste any time talking to the Romans to tell him there is a wrath that God possesses. I'm not going to read that whole verse yet, but I want you to know that as Paul's speaking, he gets to the latter part of verse 20, and he says, men are without excuse. So when you get, you will have no time you will have no time. I, I know it's very close. We, we, some of you, you need me to teach a little bit more on the depth of this. But when we stand on that day to receive judgment, we're not going to have time to have a rebuttal. Okay, there's no rebuttal. Well, I didn't know. I didn't really understand that verse. I didn't get what was being said. That's what you meant? Men are without excuse. It's written. It's already in the book. It's already taken. Men are without excuse. It says, we have clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Verse 24. Well, I don't want to get into the sexual desires. But because we are living in the days of Noah... We find in verse 28, he gave them over to the depraved minds to do what they ought not to be done. He goes on in chapter 2 talking about his righteous judgment. God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth, the word of God. That's why we need to know the word. Verse 6, it says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. I've just got to give you an up. Uh, a, a, a total up view before I get to the text that we're going to work on for a couple of weeks here, okay? Because you need to know in verse 11, for God does not show favoritism. Now, he's speaking of the different tribes, if you would. The Jews, the Gentiles, even all the ites. He doesn't show favoritism. No one's over. The truth is the truth. He goes on to talk about the Jews and the law. He gets into talking about God's faithfulness in chapter 3, which brings us to probably where I'm going to settle in for a few minutes today. And it's the first verse that I learned in the plan of salvation. Because you need to know that the reason that Jesus had to be this plan and the only plan is because we have a problem in the world. And the problem is sin. The problem is sin. 
There's two aspects of sin that I want you to pay attention to. You'll find in the book of Romans. Some of you should be reading this this week. One, there's the legal wrong. That is that word condemnation. Jesus takes care of that. But then there's also the moral wrong, and that's the condition. Jesus takes care of that. We need both of these taken care of in our lives. And when we begin to see these things taken care of in our lives, what it does is it puts us in the position to receive the gift, which is eternal life. So let me just take the next few verses here in chapter 3, verse 21 is where I'm going to start. And, uh, and I'll just segue into it coming out of what he was just talking about the law a lot. It says, no one will be justified by keeping the law. The law's purpose is to show us where we fall short. Fall short is a key description of sin. But the contrast between the prior and now in verse 21, but now a righteousness from God. A righteousness from God. You're going to discover that the righteousness is Christ. Okay, the righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. There's a believing that has to accompany your response. I have to believe He is who He says He is, and I also have to believe He will do what He says He will do. I believe in Jesus. There is no difference. For all have sinned. All. No one can convince you that they have yet to sin. All have sinned. We were born into sin because of the fall of Adam and Eve. That began the downward spiral, if you would, of the condition that was because of the condemnation, the sin of man. All of sin. So that actually is an encouragement that none of us here were perfect. I know some of you thought you were. But we're not there. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is the definition truly in the Scriptures of sin. We fall short of His glory. We fall short. And we are justified freely by His grace through redemption that came by Christ. I, I just need to take a moment, and I want to go back to a couple of the verses, because I wanted to give you the description of what sin will result in and the consequences of the condition that sin causes in our life. If we fulfill living in this manner. So one is back in Romans 1.18. Now I'll read it in its fullest. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Let's read Romans 1.21 in its fullness. It says, For although they knew God, they never, neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. What, what happened with sin was, and this is where we are, I believe, today, is, is that we attach sin to man, man doing wrong against man. There's a value of sin with mankind. What we forget is, is that sin doesn't have to do with man. It has to do with God, our wrong against God. The result is, is that man against man is going to be wrong. We look at things happening in the news, we look at things that are happening around us, and we may claim that is sin, that is wrong. And it is against God, but unfortunately, we as mankind, we take it on this level. It's man against man. We're trying to vote against man against man. We're trying to live 
We're trying to justify, which we have devalued, this sounds weird, sin. When we attach it to man. Yes, it's wrong. It's wrong for abuse. It's wrong for, for murder. It's wrong for the thing lying. It's going to devastate. Things are going to devastate people, hurt people. And yes, we should rally and we should do our best to help people in these matters. Yes, but ultimately, that's not what he died for. He died so he can bring reconciliation, a propitiation of what severed the relationship with God. So salvation, I, I, it's, it's a choice, folks. I, I'm, I told you I've been reading this particular book, and it's really revolutionized some of my thinking because I being, I've been raised in the church, okay? I've not been bashful with that. I've been, thank you, Jesus, you know? I'm sitting in the basket next to mom playing the piano like two weeks after being born, you know? Uh, there was no maternity leave back then, church, man. You get you get, get to church, you play. There wasn't no nurseries back then either. You know, be quiet over there. Now, I was singing loud back then too. Mom plays a loud piano. I know it's because she was trying to get over my voice. But just because somebody prays a prayer that we call a prayer of salvation, Okay, we have to give everything a title, okay? And I think that that's not been healthy, all right? But I'm going to try my best to help you here. We pray a prayer of salvation. That doesn't mean everything changes. I mean, we, we would like to think, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool? We pray a sal- prayer of salvation, and we get up, and we are no longer, we are no longer going to be bound by the same desires we had when we came to pray. That we're no longer going to be tempted. We're no longer going to have struggles. Everything, I mean, boom, like lightning bolt, changed. I know. I've heard testimonies of people that had vices in their lives. And, and the Lord have not just do a miracle of, of forgiving them of their sin and coming into their life, but, but just completely taking appetites away of those vices in their life. I get that. But the majority of people in the world have to get up walk back, and some of them have to sit next to the struggle in which they walked in with that was not being the encouragement in their walk with the Lord. Some of them had to go back into a place of work the next day which there was going to be the same challenges. Your boss didn't change overnight. Your co-workers are still the same. Some of you still have the same struggles with your neighbors. And your children, you get the picture, it's usually with some other type of people, human, the creation. But the difference is, you made a decision at an altar. This is an altar, by the way. It's just not a bench up front that costs more for y'all to sit up in the front row, okay? It's an altar. You made a decision, a decision, a decision that I want to accept what he's offering. And he freely gives it to you. And when he freely gives it to you, he's now going to walk with you. That's why I believe that you need to learn to walk with Jesus and let Jesus walk with you. Some people get saved. This is, this is a challenge for my thinking. I grew up in this. They get saved and they say, thank you, Jesus, shake his hand and walk back out. and Never take Jesus with them from the altar. That is a problem because next week they should be back in the altars, and many of them are. Too many people are getting saved over and over and over and over again. And that's because they don't take Jesus with them. Jesus makes this offer. When you accept what I'm giving you, I'm going to go with you if you want me to. (laughs) And then he's going to help you when you walk out the door. And the person you're with, or the persons you're with, or the persons you encounter, bring one of those temptations. And the book I'm reading is one that she's saved, 
and she was leading an LGBT lifestyle. And I know that many of you good Christians in here think, well, she immediately no longer had those desires. And she openly admits in her book, her testimony, I still had those and I didn't understand that because I was told for so long I get saved, I automatically become straight. It's like I automatically no longer am tempted to watch that kind of movie. I'm no longer tempted to say those kind of lies. I mean, those of you that cheat on your taxes when it comes April again, even though you've prayed and asked Jesus in your heart, you may still be wanting to cheat and take the same benefits that are not really benefits. Listen, living for Jesus is always good up until the point where it's not where you think it's good for you. This is this is. I think the ultimate message today, and I better close here, because for the wages, uh, I want to get to Romans 6, 23. We're going to get there, but hit this one right here. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word fall kept stirring in my spirit. Anybody know that verse? You've said that before? Fall short of the glory of God. The Lord said there's another place that that word fall is, and I want you to pay attention to it, because, see, back to we attach sin as People, men, mankind wronging one another, okay? And we want to fix that. We don't, we don't want abortions. No. 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 We don't want sex trafficking. No. We don't want that. We want to clean it all up. There's a bigger issue than that, though. It's what we forget. He said, we devalue it man to man. He said, that's pride. My wife knows I've been using this word a lot because God's been really working on it. Because mankind, we, we in America especially, man, growing up in grade school, in junior high, man, we, every week, I would take my 25 cents and buy me one of those colored ribbons. And back then, they didn't care if you had 42 punches on your knee. They'd sell those little needles with them, and you'd punch them on your, I'd hang them, you know. You'd have kids walking around on, on football day with ribbons hanging all down there. Crush them, kill them, smear them. I mean, we had words on there that would make school students today blush. I mean, it was bad. I mean, back in the day in football, that they, the, the linemen would carry pencils and poking. I mean, it was back in real sports back in those days. But they always had pride, war horse pride. Wildcat pride. We are driven as Americans to have pride. Pride goeth before a fall. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory. God said the the meaning's the same. We fall short. Of the glory of God. We fall short when we don't recognize that the wrong that is here is the wrong against God. And the only way is to have a moment of conversation, a prayer of salvation, a moment where we change from who we once were. Now we're walking. Pride is where we as mankind, we got this. We got this. Thought it was interesting that speaking on the same, LGBT calls it pride. I'm like, if you've read the Bible, I don't know that I would ever use the word pride goeth before a fall. But they don't see. Sinners are all on the same level. You know all sin is like right together. Okay? You're lying to your wife of where you were last Friday night. It's it's, 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 the same sin, you know. I was going to start naming them. The Holy Spirit said, be careful of naming sins in the house. Sexual sin is that on the, it's an inner. Okay, so I know that there's a little different definition, but sin, sin. Pride. Where I got this, I can control this. It's more than, we. America wants you to be a smile. America wants it to be something I want to say proud of because that's the word we've been taught. Wants to put a positive on it. But what we're saying is I can do this. And that's America right there. That's why it's so hard to minister to men. Men, you're very, can I just say it? Men, you're very prideful. 
No one can tell you what to do. No one can tell you how to do it. No one can get in and see your, your chinks and your armor. No one can see your weaknesses. No one can see your sorrows. No, you can't let it down at the house. The moment you do, then, then that shows you, you just can't. Got to deal with the issues because ultimately what we're learning in this, Jesus is coming soon. And what I'm afraid of, and I'm going to use that in the correct term here, is that there are more people that are sitting in the house of God today that will miss heaven in eternity than there will be those that will go. Scripture says it's like a 50-50. One will be taken, one will be left. He's got arithmetic in there. So how many of you in here, if I split the number, want to be the 50 that go, and who of the 50 would want to be the ones that stay? And what if I told you that all you have to do to be a part of the 50 that go is to, is to change the way you've been living? Now, you think that's easier said than done. The doctor told you to change some of the ways you live, and you'll live longer, and you haven't done that yet. Everything we do on this side of heaven, I believe, is practice for what we do in the spiritual world. That's why I think coming to churches, man, that is the simplest discipline in your life to do. And we, we have people that fail that every day. And I'm going to close with this, okay? Because y'all are tired of hearing that because you want to get to Romans 6, 23. You don't want to miss next week. Woo! Wages of sin is death. We're going to talk about wages and the gift of God is what? Eternal life. See, ooh, got a great illustration for that. Things that we do right now, coming to church is just a simple discipline. There's not, it's not one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt go to church. But it's just a, it's a practice. I almost will guarantee you the people that make it a practice to come to church once a week are at least reading their Bible once a week. Oh, I read my Bible, I don't need church. I would like to be a fly on your wall. Because if you couldn't find Jesus once a week, time for him once a week, then you usually, listen, I come to church, and I have a hard time finding opportunities for Jesus during the week. It's a busy week. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin, the value, should be returned to what it does. It hurts God. The consequences, and I'll close with Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, 10 and 11. This is the consequence of that condition of sin. I knew I should have marked it. He too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image. For anyone who rises receives the mark of his name. Sin will cost you everything. I believe that the gift is very Easy to, to identify in Scripture, it's eternal life. It says the gift of God is eternal life. I, be, I believe it is easy to receive that gift. It is more difficult to live a life that leads to holiness, which we will find when we get to Romans 6.23. And I believe that if you truly knew the devastation and the horror of what sin will do in someone's life when Jesus does come back, that you would make that gift a priority as what you give to everyone you come in contact with. Every person that you see on, in, on your pathway, you should wonder, do you have the gift? And then you should have the guts enough to then begin to ask people, do you have the gift? What gift? Well, let me tell you about the gift. And that's those trainings. That's those opportunities. But until you get motivated, that your family and friends are going to spend eternity in a place of torment that I just read, that's a different kind of day and night and smoke coming up than the day and night we just sang about with the incense of worship. Until you're motivated, some of your grandparents need to realize some of your grandkids will spend eternity in hell if something doesn't change. 
Some of you parents need to realize some of your children will spend eternity in hell if something doesn't change. Some of you spouses, your spouse will, listen, you're going to have to get a little bolder. We all are. I can't get that bold. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Never was intended to be done without all three of them involved. When Jesus said, Father, I'll take care of this. Well, I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming back. Holy Spirit said, I'll help them until they do, until you do. And then we just keep, I can handle pride. I, can, I don't need the Holy Spirit. I can do this. I don't need Jesus. I can do this. Pride. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. The first thing we've got to deal with in this series, I said it wasn't a series, in this grouping of sermons, is I, I want you to deal with pride. You're saying, I don't know if I have pride. Well, ask the Holy Spirit, do I have pride? And then I want, those of you that said, say, I don't have pride, you have pride, by the way, if you say that. If you say, I don't have pride, you have pride. I want you to deal with it. Now, Jesus said he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He is faithful. Jesus is more faithful than we are. And then he's going to ask, he's going to walk with you. So I'm going to lift my hand right now. I want everybody to look at pastor. Pastors ask the Lord to deal with some pride in his life. Okay. I've got some pride in my life. I've got some pride in my life. Let's, let's not be, thank you, Kirk. Let's not be bashful anymore. But let's not bow our heads, close our eyes. That's, that's the chicken way to get out. That's like, give me a blindfold and a cigarette. Come on. Anybody else got some pride in your life you want God? I don't know why that seemed to be what God said deal with first, but Anybody else? Anybody? Come on. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I, you know there's only one thing to do. Say, hey, Lord, forgive me of my pride. Come on. Lord, help me. Help me right now. I need your help. I need your help right now. God, I need your help. Hallelujah. 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 Just help me, God. Hallelujah. 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 Lord God, you're worthy. You're worthy. We sang about it, but Lord God, we know that you can change everything right now. God, you are. Hallelujah. We have a new identity today. I identify humbly as a Christ follower today, not a pridefully as a Christian. You know what? You can be prideful Christian and you can go to hell. That's it. I'm pride. No, Lord God, I need to, what does it mean to be, I prayed that prayer the other day. Some of y'all, that's a brave prayer to pray. Lord, I need to be more humble. Lord God, help me to be more humble. Oh God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, right now. Lord, I got friends and family that need to know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look, I know, I know. One more illustration, look at me real quick. This week, I'm in a massive hurry. You ever been in a massive hurry? My foot is down at the gas pedal. I'm checking the speed because I want to make sure I get that little grace period that some of the cops give you. Like, I don't normally do this. I'm usually the slow guy. My daughter's like, really, Dad? You know, you got five more miles. You can go an hour, right? I am going, and I'm hungry, and I'm hangry, and, I, and I'm thirsty, and I got my teacup, and I got my coffee, and I, and I see Bill Miller's, and I'm like, I got to stop quick. And Lisa's calling me. My father's calling me. It's just, I just, I, mean, I want to stop. I pull in. I leave the engine going. The dog is in there. You guard the truck, okay? I lock the door, okay? And I run in, and I'm running fast. You know, when, when you, like, run in there to get it, and there's no one behind the counter. Hurry! I, I would, and so they come out. Well, what do you want? And, and they only learn one way. Is this for here or to go? I've already told them. It's to go. I want twee. I want it unsweet. I want easy eyes. Would you like sweet or unsweet? You're killing me here. Lisa's calling. I ignored the first one. Sorry, babe. I'm just like, if y'all hurry, I can get back to the truck, back to the dog, on the road, caffeine in me. I'm good. Like, I'm getting both coffee and tea, all right? And, and I'm looking, waiting. And I look next to me. And there's my cousin. I hadn't seen him in over, I don't know if I, I don't know if I've seen him anywhere since the pandemic. Isn't it horrible that we live close to our cousins, lived over in Elmendorf, and you don't see him for two years? Shame on us. 
And it just got worse from there. Lisa's calling. The lady on the back can't get anything going. I'm trying to. And he starts asking me questions like, how you doing? What's going on? They're not getting me my taco. He's like, hey, let's sit down a minute. I said, I ain't got time. I did. I said, I'm getting mine to go. The truck's running. His response was, where's it going to go? Oh, Jesus. This does not fit into my day. Jesus goes, it really didn't fit into my schedule to hang on the cross either. But I did it. So what are you crucifying today? So I answered Lisa's call. I did tell him. I said, let me answer my wife's call. Took care of that. Truck is one of those that shuts off 15 minutes. Dog, I knew I had 15 minutes. And I can just click it from inside, turn it back on. Dog just sleeps until I get back. He sits down. They mess up his order. We've got to remake it. Oh, this, this story gets longer. But we just sat there. Did you lead him to Jesus? No. But at some point when I quit being selfish, stuck on myself, wrapped up in my own world, and I began to realize Jesus just wanted to be there with skin on for a moment, could I just represent him? Can I just, he just needed someone to listen. And I just listened to him. Listen, it's not that hard, but yet it's the most difficult thing in the world. Jesus is coming again. And there are a lot of people that are going to miss. They're going to miss a gift of eternal life. And they're going to receive a wage of eternal death. And it's not going to be God's fault. It's going to be ours. It's going to be ours. I love you, but I love Him more. And to love Him more means i got to work harder for Him than ever before. It's time. The pandemic's over. Biden said so. And he always speaks truth. But Jesus also said it is finished. And he definitely speaks truth. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for willfully saying, Lord, I got pride. Take it out of my life. Now, when you ask God to take something out, there's a void. It's kind of like when you get a tooth pulled. The doctor says you need to probably take care of that pretty quick. If not, something can happen bad. And get, Anybody ever had the bad happen? So when you leave here, you need to start doing something to take care of that new void that's in your life of pride. The best thing is to read God's Word. Spend time with Jesus. Let Him fill this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. I'm not making apologies to our guests, but we don't get in a hurry. But I do try to get you out before the Baptist. <laughs> I was with the restaurant owner this week. He said, do you all know that all you churches lit out in waves? Like I get one of you all at a time. I know that no one's getting out right now at this moment. So if you hurry. But when you go, remember this, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Wherever you go, glorify Jesus. Amen. And boy, I would be a miss if I missed the opportunity to say, Marilyn, you did wonderful today. Thank you. I'm going to find some of you others' hidden talents in the room. Marilyn said, yep, he'll find you. Amen. See you next Saturday, even if you haven't signed up.